something that uh, we started to do a few years ago. We as a physicist, uh, from time to time, need to go to data, or if you don't have the data, uh, do the experiment and test the theory. Uh, and then um, I started to do evolutionary game theory inspired by biology at some point in 2005, 2006. But this turned into something that was also uh, an indication or, or a way to model human behavior. And when we deal with human, um, there are a lot of things that you have to take into account. And normally, uh, theory is one thing and experience is another thing. So this talk will be more or less about my journey into one specific problem that it's uh, human cooperation. And it's one specific aspect of human behavior. So cooperation, uh, as I just mentioned, um, can be seen at all levels of biological organization, from the cell to small animals to uh, lion hunting uh, big um, um, prey, etc. And, and then in, in human society, that's actually cooperation is behind our ultra uh, modern society as we were able to get agreements and build up a society that is uh, very far from what it was uh, in, in our, I don't know, 2,000 years ago. Uh, very far in the sense that I don't know if it's better than 2,000 years ago, but at least it's more developed than 2,000 years ago. So that's the problem. This is an evolutionary puzzle. I, I actually, Darwin himself, when he wrote the, the origin of a species, recognized that his theory could not explain uh, the origin and, and emergence and, and sustain of cooperation among the different, uh, different species. The key idea was that um, his theory cannot account for facts like, for example, uh, a species that sacrifice uh, at the cost with, uh, for example, to um, help other species like human, for example, when you help somebody else that is not related to you. There is no any kind of key relationship and therefore that could not be explained by uh, an selective advantage, let's say, for natural selection, that you, what you do normally in gene selection, for example, is to help your relative so you can propagate your pool of genes to, from one generation to the other. But this, uh, let's say, non-kin um, cooperation cannot be explained by the Darwin theory, and since that, more than 150 years ago, it has remained as evolutionary possible. One way to um, study this is with uh, game theory, and in particular, I will focus on the problem of cooperation and coordination among humans. And so this is just a few questions that we would like to be able to answer. For example, how cooperation emerges in the both in humans? Uh, what are the mechanisms that promote cooperative behavior? Uh, how does our behavior change when we interact with other individuals and with our environment? And whether we can build or not realistic models uh, of how individuals behave and use them to study uh, other problems that have to do with societal or organizational uh, dynamics. So uh, normally this is done uh, theoretically using game theory, this is a branch of applied mathematics, uh, in which you study um, strategic interactions between two or more individuals. Um, I will focus there on a lot of different games or different situations that you can model using this, but I will focus uh, on these four because they can be expressed as two by two games with a payoff matrix. Uh, there are two actions available for the players. And depending on the ordering of these entries of the payoff matrix that I will explain later, uh, you have different games. Harmony, which is, uh, a, let's say, favors cooperation. And then the most famous one is the prisoner's dilemma, which is uh, the one in which cooperation, the survival of cooperation is more difficult. This is uh, the game that if you are able to explain why cooperation survives using this kind of games, then it should be no problem to explain also all the kind of ordering of this period of matters. Then you can study Nash equilibrium and so on and so forth. A lot of, of different things that uh, game theorists and mathematicians do, but um, and we, we have done a few things about that also, but I would like to focus more on the experimental aspect and, and try to find uh, mechanisms that promote cooperation. So let's explain a little bit more, the, for example, the prisoner dilemma, that is the, the hardest for, for cooperation. So essentially you have a payoff matrix 
in which you have two players, and depending on your action, and also the action of your opponent, you get a payoff. Um, and the ordering is, is this one, where T is here, R, uh, punishment, and, and what is called the sacrifice period. So if you are, for example, a player that you are a cooperator, and you are playing with another cooperator, both of you get, in this example, three. If you are a cooperator and your opponent is a defector, then the defector gets five, but you, and you get zero. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, if you are a defector and, and your opponent is a cooperator, then you get five and, and the cooperator gets zero. The other way around here, this is symmetric, and then if both are defector, both get one. So as you see, whatever your opponent does, the best for you from an individual point of view is to play as defector. Because if you play as defector with a cooperator, you will earn five, and if you play with uh, another defector, you will earn one. That is more than if you play cooperator with a defector because you, in this case, earn zero. But if both were cooperator, the total amount, the total wealth of, for both players would be um, higher than uh, unilateral defection. That's, that's the problem here. That's where the dilemma is. What is best for you from an individual point of view and what is best for, the, for both of you, for a collective, um, let's say, for, for a collective uh, game. So this is the, the dilemma um, and the evolutionary game dynamics um, is, is the theory that describes how population of these individuals evolve. So once you, you, are, you pick an action and the other one pick another action, then you, uh, so at some point you say, okay, I, if, if the game is repeated, you say, okay, I heard this, maybe I have to change my strategy because I want to maximize my payoff or I don't want to be the suckers anymore, so I would like to evolve my uh, strategy. And this is where evolutionary game dynamics enters into, into the game, because then you have a lot of, well, this is uh, the snow drift, our example in which uh, if both cooperate, both can meet first here and first here, but if there is no cooperation, no of these uh, can meet. So uh, when you are going to evolve the, the the population of agents, of the factor of cooperators, you can use a lot of different strategies uh, to evolve this. This is a moral process that is usually uh, done for in biological systems. Essentially, you take um, randomly, well, not randomly, it's proportional to your payoff, someone that you replace with uh, different strategies. Uh, imitate the best, you look at your neighborhood or at the whole system, and see what is the one that has the largest payoff, and then you imitate the strategy of that player. Uh, this is replicator dynamics, that is one that uh, we use a lot. Essentially, is uh, depending on uh, how far you are from the average um, payoff on the population. So it depends on the on your payoff and the average in the population. Uh, this Fermi-like rule is just allowed for irrational move. It's something that is proportional to the difference between payoff explain it a little bit more. And a few more. So you have a lot of these evolutionary uh, rules because in this case what evolves is the population of individual, not the strategy itself. So for example, one, 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 uh, one case in which you would be interested is uh, very, for example, as, as, you, as you do when you do disease uh, spreading, is you have a population of fully cooperator, for example, and you want to calculate, for example, the invasion probability. If you place in this fully cooperative population a defector, you would like to see under which condition there is a takes over of defectors over the population of cooperator. This sort of things, then you can study how this depends on the rules that you are implementing or on the network of contact, etc. But there is one important question when you go to study humans is if these rules make sense at all, if people play or, or evolve their strategies following these kind of rules. And this is what uh, we questioned uh, a few years ago. Actually, you can show that uh, the way in which this uh, evolves depends a lot on, on the network, on the topology that you have, for example, and on the initial conditions. For example, let's suppose that you have a linear change, and, and you can easily see that uh, there, there are only two possible states, full cooperation and full defection. 
and there is only one condition, initial condition, that leads you to the state of full cooperation, which is the one in which everybody is cooperator at the beginning, and two uh, to the power of n minus, minus one, that leads you to a uh, fully defective system. But then you should change a bit this, and you, for example, do a starlight graph, and then you can show that actually there are uh, more initial conditions that, that leads you to um, <coughs> A full uh, cooperation, and there is also the state of full defection. For example, you can show that if the central node is a cooperator and you have p peripheral nodes where p is defined by this, then this is the temptation to defect, then the system will end up in a fully uh, cooperator um, regime. So, this already shows with very simple topologies that there are a lot of things uh, behind this. Uh, the network structure, the initial condition, etc., etc. Uh, actually, if you do this in more complex uh, topologies, you can show that uh, in general, what you have is that there is a cluster of what we call pure cooperators. This is these are people that all the time cooperate, and these are connected to a set of individuals that from so from time to time change from cooperation to defection. So sometimes cooperate, sometimes defect and the pure defectors, that are the individuals that all the time uh, are defectors. For this to be stable, you have to add another pure cooperator here that only interact with this, because th these guys represent the stable source of benefits for this, so they can play as pure cooperator without, uh, let's say, changing the strategy. And then you can do some math here and, and for example, demonstrate that there is a set of initial conditions that is invariant for the evolutionary dynamics which means that no trajectory inside F evolves to an equilibrium configuration out of F. So this is more or less what you can do analytically in simple topologies because uh, you are fixing this and this is somehow arbitrary but um, uh, with some given condition. Actually when you do the simulation, for example a scale-free network and represent the final state of the system, you see that this is the actual structure of how cooperation is organized. So you have these pure cooperators here, then these that interact with the fluctuating, and these fluctuations are connected to the factor node. So this is more or less the structure of cooperation. Um, and for this, uh, Robert May um, and Martin Novat in, in the early 90s, uh, working in, in lattices, they found actually that uh, cooperation can be, uh, and using the prisoner dilemma, that cooperation can be sustained if uh, there is some network structure, because there are these clusters of cooperators that uh, provide benefits for themselves and they can survive the invasion of the factors. And the scale free networks, then in the 20, uh, 2005 to 2006, there were different works that show that this effect is enhanced when you have more complex structure like scale free network, etc. So, all this is okay if you are analyzing the biological system of bacteria, for example, because you don't actually know how these bacteria uh, behave. They, the bacteria actually cannot take decisions. Uh, this is just ruled by um, the biology of the system. But then you can question whether this is true at all when you play with human. And I would like to bring to your attention one quote by Richard Feynman that I like very much because it's very for this, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. So the question is if these agree with the experiment or not, and I will advance that most of the time they do not. So um, let me show you one simple example of uh, human behavior that shows already that we are very uh, prone to be influenced by very small details in our environment. So this is a very simple and nice experiment that was done in the UK University, in the department in the UK University. So you have a kind of coffee room with coffee and tea. You can go prepare your coffee, your tea, and you can put milk, of course you are in Britain, you can put milk in the coffee or in the, in the tea. And, and if you put milk, you, you have to pay a fixed amount. But you are given the freedom to choice whether you pay or not. So if you put milk, and you are going to pay you, let's say you have to pay 20 cents. But if you want, you cannot, you, you don't pay.
So what they do is to put just in front of the dispensers different photos. Each week they change each photo, so flowers and, and eyes, and then they collected. They just added up how much was collected each week, um, and the results were quite uh, for me amazing because. It's something as simple as an image in front of the dispenser changed a lot the amount collected. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that is not, uh, I mean, it's no, no one washing, actually washing, it's just a photo. Uh, and you see that there are a lot of them. So if you want to collect more, then you can put uh, items like this, uh, and you will. We are changing policy for the coffee. <laughs> 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 Be not be sure that we'll be a guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for for instance, is that will mean that humans can be fine tuned as as we as we usually talk. Um, so this is a simple example that already tells you that we are very influenced by a lot of us. We can be influenced by small details like this. So what we did was okay. Let's test this this theory um, and let's do some experiments. Um, this is back in 2011. So the, the, the most affected uh, for human behavior rules were they imitate the best, and then these two, this is the replicator uh, equation that we inherit from, from biology. So essentially the frequencies of strategy X change with time according to this equation. Uh, so the most important thing here is that it depends on the difference of payoff between you and, and your opponent. Or, or the people that play uh, one strategy and the people that play another strategy. Uh, but this doesn't allow, when you implement this, it doesn't allow irrational move in the sense that you change your strategy only if this favors your payoff. So if this uh, is larger than zero. This is for, so you are assuming full rationality in this case. The Fermi like rule allows you to also adopt some irrational move in the sense that. Even if it's small, the probability of adopting uh, a strategy that in principle could lead you to get less payoff is possible. So this is the, the Fermi life rule that saturates depending on the difference of payoff, etc. Yeah, so, we, yeah. What, what is the depth pressure of G here? Uh, this is uh, some, some normalization factor. This is something that you have to take into account to, to assure that this is between 0 and 1. And depends on the topology of the system. Uh, normally, it's the maximum allowed payoff difference between two uh, any two players in the system. So, um, so the first experiment that was reported for relatively large system was this one that was done by my collaborator uh, Sanchez Ancho in Madrid, and they do an experiment with 169 people. So this sounds like a small number, but this is huge, but for for a behavioral economist. Uh, that is usually uh, is used to do experiments with 10, 20 people in the lab. This is 169. So what they do was did was to um, do different experiments, and they put these people to play on a regular lab, a grid, uh, and they measure what is the probability of playing or cooperation after um, uh, as a function of the number of cooperators in the neighborhood. And they notice is that um, depending on your last move, the probability of cooperation increases if you play as cooperator before in the last round, and decreases if you play as defector. So if you play as defector, the most likely outcome is that you still keep playing as defector, and if you play cooperation as a cooperator, the most likely is that you keep uh, playing as cooperator. But this depends on the number of of uh, of cooperators in the neighborhood. So it doesn't seem to be any relation with the payoff, but it's more uh, depending on the density or if you want the number of cooperators in the neighborhood. But still, this is, let's say, for um, a regular network, um, and then this doesn't answer the question whether the network has some effect. There were a lot of words and, and, and proposals, particular Martin Novak and, and others, I myself, when, we, when I started to do theory about this, claiming that um, heterogeneous structures promote cooperation and this kind of thing. So what we did is, 
the first thing that we did is, okay, if we assume that this is okay, let's see what happened in other topologies. And you can do some math, a midfield approximation, you can express the average level of cooperation and then do some math. And then what, what you to do, you get to this equation that relates the density of cooperation as a function of the density of the factors in your network. And as you see, there is no difference, payoff difference here. And actually when you do this uh, in different topologies, you see that for scale free, for lattice, or in the mean field version that is all to all, you will expect the same um, behavior for the average level of cooperation as a function of the density of cooperation. So you see here that the network has no effect there. But again, this is still theory, but it, this is something that you take from the experiment, one rule that you found, and see, okay, if I assume that this is true for whatever network I have, what would I, would, would I expect? And, and you see that you should expect no dependency with the network topology. But again, it still is not an, an experiment. So the next step was, okay, this is a prediction of the model. Let's compare scale free and lattice and, if, and do the experiment. The problem with doing this experiment with scale free networks is that, as you know, if you want to generate a heterogeneous network, then you have to uh, go to at least 500, 600 people. So to have some heterogeneity in the degree distribution. And we are talking about humans. So how can I do an experiment with 600 people at the same time? Well, we did in Zaragoza in 2012. We took our students, high school students, from, from 42 schools, and they were playing in their computer labs, and we developed a software that allowed them to connect, so you, they, it's blind for them, but uh, behind the software, they are, were connected using two different topologies. 625 were here, playing with a regular lattice, with uh, periodic boundary conditions, so actually it's kind of this. And um, everybody have connectivity for those, that means that you have only four neighbors. And then we generated 609, so this 1,229 individuals were playing at the same time, um, where the degree goes from 2 to 16, is the, is the, the, the one that has the largest number of neighbors. And so the, the question was, okay, how would be the how is the cooperation, the average cooperation in these two very different networks? So this is, for example, how you present the, the model. There are a lot of subtleties where to do these experiments. You see, for example, that I cannot tell them that if you cooperate and the other one cooperate and so on and so forth, because that induces some kind of psychological effect and then that could somehow frame the, the experiment. So what you actually do is, if you choose blue and the other one choose blue, then you get Seven. If you choose blue and the other one this other color, then you get zero. But then if you use color, you have to be careful with blind colors and color blind people. And actually we, we did that. We removed combination of colors uh, that account for 99% of color blindness. And still we found two when we did the experiment. So it's, it was kind of... That were color blind to these. To, yeah, 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 to, to these colors. Um, but then it, you can change the color and that's it. But uh, there are a lot of these, so it's, it's a lot of fun. So this is what they see. For example, one that has three, 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 connect, three individuals. Uh, so this is the instruction saying they have to choose. And then you show them what is the payoff um, um, and in the color, the, the action. So if this is cooperators or whatever. So this is how your, uh, the neighbors member and this is the, the color of, uh, I mean, that represent the strategy. And then you go back again to this and you do the experiment for a number of rounds. Of course, they don't know neither the number of, the total number of rounds. You tell them you will be playing um, from 25 to 35 rounds because it's documented that if you know the number of rounds at the very end, you start to defect because that will give you more uh, profit. This is a video of the experiment. These are the 42 schools, uh, and they were connected. So one of these slides indicates that one of these guys is connected to one of these. Um, the red is for uh, cooperation, the, the green is for the faction. Um, so this is, uh, I said, 42 schools in the whole uh, community of Aragon. Zaragoza is, is this one, but this is uh, Huesca, and this is Teruel, so it's different parts. Why there is a 
kind of lightning halo around the, the school from 10 to 9? Um, yeah. uh, this is just because you focus there, but uh, the, the, because actually there was a graph here showing the level of cooperation. Oh. Uh, but I removed that from this. So this is the, the experiment and the results. This is the average level of cooperation when you do the experiments in lattice and heterogeneous and the control. The control consists in that you reshuffle the network at every time step. Every round, all the, you keep the degree sequence, but everyone changes the neighbor. So they, they play with different people all the time. And you see that both in the control and in the experiment, the network has no effect. It's the same level of cooperation that you get on lattice and heterogeneous. So this tells you that actually all the theory that I myself included uh, were doing, it's useless when you go to study human behavior. Because there are a lot of things that enters into play that you are not taking into account in, in, when you do the theory. Actually, kind of microscopically, it's also very close what you see, the cooperative rounds and the number of players that uh, were playing for, uh, were cooperating for a number, a given number of rounds, you see that more or less is the same. Then you have a question. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about how the experiment works if you're playing with 16 other people. Uh, with 16? So like, yeah, yeah, with 16 other people. Yeah. So do you play 16 individual games with each of those 16 people, or do you pick one color and then those others all pick their... I'm not sure if I understood your question. No, essentially the, the, the <coughs> network is static. If that's what you are asking, the network is static. So once you have this, these neighbors, the neighbors change, but your degree is the same. In the control setting, the networks could be, I mean, this could be me, this could be Alex, and then in the next round, this could be you and, and Kate, for example. Always, this is always two. two by two, right? Always yeah, two. it's always two by two. So it's a repeated game, the payoff matter doesn't change, so it's... it's so you're playing, you're playing with your degree number of people simultaneously? Yeah, yeah, everybody is, is playing at the same time, so if and everybody is taking the decision at the same time. But you use uh, one color, so you decide one color for all the games? Uh, no, 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 the color was assigned randomly. No, 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 but each time, let's imagine I have three neighbors. Yeah. I play independently the same with action. each neighbor, or I choose my color, and that is the one that I play with no, all the three no, neighbors. No, no, you play, you choose your color, and this color is Plays for, with for the, the, all the your brain. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the yeah. action. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you are not, it's, it's not fair way, it's in the sense that you play first with this, then with this, and then with this. Once you take this, this applies to all the interactions that you have. So, uh, and the reason why you see this, and it, it doesn't uh, match with theory, is that actually when you uh, plot here the frequency of people that cooperate or defect as a function of the difference of their payoff, you don't see any difference. That means that people don't take into account the payoff difference when they take uh, the decisions about how to play. They actually, what they do is what, what it was found in, in the experiments in Madrid, the previous experiment. There is this moody conditional cooperation that essentially means that you take your decision based on your last action and the density of cooperators in the neighborhood. But you don't take into account the payoff difference. Yeah. Sorry, do 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 the the the, the, the others observe your payoff or your action or, or it's like a private uh, game. Okay, you you observe others Actions. Yes, yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, this is here. This is the information that I actually give to the players. Okay. So if this is you, you are in the center, and then you see the action that is <coughs> modified by the color. So here is the color. So this guy plays this action, mm -hmm. and, and this is the payoff, the accumulated payoff of, of that, 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 that guy in, the, in this round. So based on that information, so essentially you have what they play, which is in turn, but to, to, be, uh, to be clear, it's if they cooperated or not, mm -hmm. you don't call that cooperation or defection, but you know which of the two is cooperator and which of the two is defector, so you know if cooperated or not, and then you also have the information about the total payoff of that individual in the last round. Okay. And based on that, you take your decision. It turns out that people don't take into account their payoff. They take into account how many 
cooperators they are in the neighborhood. So this is the matter of conclusion. So um, of course this is just one experiment with a fixed payoff matrix and then you have a lot of questions. So you say, okay, what happens if we change the payoff matrix? Well, okay, that has not been answered yet because um, these this experiments are a very it's a nightmare, logistically speaking. And then it's, this, for example, was kind of uh, 15,000 euros just to pay participants because you have to pay participants. Otherwise, it's meaningless. Real money, you have to pay them. Then there are questions like uh, if there are cross cultural effects, uh, if this change occur, uh, across the individual lifetime. Because we, we did that with um, high school students. Normally, results are reported for um, one second year, first second year um, uh, university students because they are the ones that are available. And then also the question whether this this is because the network is static or not. So I will briefly go through uh, to answer some of these questions. Cross cultural effects. Well, it could be, there could be cross-cultural effect. Actually, there is one game in which this is well documented. This is the ultimatum game. In the ultimatum game, you have something to divide, for example, one euro or one dollar, and then I propose you to split this dollar in a given way, for example, 20 cents for you and 80 cents for me. If you accept, we make the deal. If you don't accept, no one gets anything. Um, Theoretically speaking, the Nash uh, solution to this is that I should offer you the less I can, one cent, and you should accept that, that because one cent is more than nothing. And you, if you are fully rational, you should accept that. But of course, we are human, so you say, okay, you are taking 99 cents and me one cent? No, I don't want that deal. And so uh, here are results that have been done using with this experiment. Uh, in many places uh, around the world, and for example, if you look at the mean offer, that means the, the mean acceptance rate or, or a split. Uh, you see that it's gone from 26, 0.26 to, for example, 0.58, uh, 36. So there is a lot of variation depending on where you are. There are some of these things that can be explained. For example, this one. Uh, this is because this is small. Um, culture um, in, in Indonesia, uh, for them it's, um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's, uh, the culture says that you should accept whatever you are proposed, or not, the other way around, you should give more than what you take you, for yourself, so you should be generous. And there are other places there that it's the contrary, you should accept whatever you are offered because that's uh, it's kind of respectful for your uh, host. So, Obviously, there are cross-cultural effects. I have to say that we haven't seen such a, a huge effect in the experiment that we have done. We have done experiments in Madrid, in Zaragoza, in Barcelona. Um, um, maybe between Zaragoza and Madrid, there are not too many differences, but uh, when, when Catalans enter into play, then um, <laughs> you know, there, are, there could be some differences. So this should be addressed more, more, more carefully. The, the other was um, across an 